Good evening. Um, this evening, uh, Professor Frank Cox and I are going to talk are going to talk about a subject which has uh, hit the news in quite a major way this year, uh, which is uh, the viral disease Zika uh, and the relatively closely related disease Dengue, both of which are passed on by one mosquito species. Um, but it's important to remember that in Sir Thomas Gresham's time, and when this college was founded, insect-borne diseases, insect-transmitted diseases, were a very, very major part of the morbidity and mortality of every country, including in Europe. So in his time, physicians would have been well used to diseases such as plague, passed on by fleas, uh, or typhus, passed on by lice. These diseases are now, fortunately, an historical memory. But what we have still got is a number of diseases in the tropical countries which are still passed on by insects. Many of them are now in slow but steady retreat. And I'm glad to say, for example, that malaria uh, and sleeping sickness, two very major diseases of Africa uh, and, in the case of malaria, also Asia and Latin America, are steadily decreasing thanks to a combination of development and improved medicine. However, one group of serious tra mosquito transmitted infections is actually increasing, and they're passed on by this particular mosquito genus, the Aedes mosquito. Now, I'm not going to talk about this at any length because Professor Cox is a world expert on this and he will be taking the second half of this talk. But I think it's important to, to note that uh, Zika and Dengue are not the only diseases that this uh, mosquito passes on. And there are two other major diseases which are having, having significant outbreaks at the moment. Uh, in Africa, uh, there are some substantial yellow fever outbreaks occurring at the present time, which we did think we had uh, largely managed to keep under public health control. Uh, and there is a relatively new outbreak of a disease called chikungunya, uh, in particularly the Caribbean, but it's also been in various uh, Asian areas, which can lead to very severe arthritis. So there are several diseases which this particular mosquito can pass on. Now Zika, as with all new infectious diseases, has led to some lurid headlines. Even in the UK, where the, out the chances of a significant Zika outbreak are, for all intents and purposes, zero. So you can imagine the headlines in the countries where this is a major problem. It's actually not a new disease. Uh, the, um, it, it was uh, first recognised, but undoubtedly had existed for longer, in 1947 in Africa, in Uganda. Uh, and uh, subsequent studies have shown that it spread to several areas of Africa um, over this, the last century. But it wasn't really very much studied until recently, essentially, as we'll come on to, because it was not seen as a very major public health problem. It then um, did a bit of uh, backpacking, hitchhiking around the world, uh, moving first to Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia, and then in the last two years, it started uh, island hopping across the Pacific, uh, first uh, with a significant outbreak um, in Micronesia, then in French Polynesia, and then got into Latin America. It is the Latin American outbreak which is the first time that we started to take this seriously, uh, which started... Uh, in 2014. Now, the reason, as I said, that Zika has not been much studies is that in non-pregnant adults, it really is not a very major risk. Only about one in four people who are uh, infected get symptoms they notice at all. And for those who do get symptoms, what most of them get is a rash, joint pains, a fever, uh, lasting a few days if they're unlucky, uh, maybe up to 10 days. For almost all of these cases, there are no long-term complications. So Zika is actually, if you're not pregnant, really not a very major disease by global standards. That's not to say that serious, serious complications can't occur, and the major one we worry about in people who are not pregnant uh, is something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Quite a lot of infections can cause this. It's not just Zika, but it, Zika is one of the diseases that can cause it. Less than one in a thousand people with Zika symptoms will get it, probably closer to one in 4,000. 
But what it causes, and it causes this after several in infections, is after a period of days to a few weeks, usually a few weeks, um, the peripheral nerves, starting right down uh, in the lower leg and then slowly ascending up the body, get affected, and people start off just with tingling, and as it ascends, it starts to affect the muscles. And it does this because the immune system is probably attacking the myelin sheath that allows the, uh, the nerves uh, to work. Um, around a third of people go on to get an ascending paralysis. So a third of people who have this particular complication of any of these diseases, and some of those have paralysis so severe that they need to have respiratory support and ventilation and intensive care. There are some deaths, but most people will make a full recovery. But this is the one serious problem with Zika if you don't have uh, pregnancy. The reason, however, that Zika is so problematic is that it has this significant association, and I'll come on to why we know this, with microcephaly in babies. And I've chosen not to illustrate this with photographs. I really don't personally think it's appropriate to do that. Uh, so I've illustrated this with um, some illustrations showing that microcephaly is not an all or none effect. You can have a mild bit or a very severe degree of microcephaly. Uh, and uh, in Zika, the entire spectrum is seen. Now, it's important also to know that microcephaly can occur in humans and indeed other animals for a number of other reasons. Zika is not the only reason this can occur. But it is certainly something, as we'll show, that has been associated uh, quite strongly with Zika. And the reason we know this is because of some excellent public health work done by our colleagues in Brazil, where there was a very major outbreak. And what uh, we have here is the notified cases of microcephaly, this very small heads born in babies, in babies born in the area, um, which peaked towards the end of 2015. And this shows the microcephaly cases in, a particularly, in a particular parts of uh, Brazil compared to previous years. And people looked at those data and they said there must be a, you know, something must be causing this. And they went, then went on to try and work out what that was. And what they very soon tweaked, and I think, again, great admiration to the scientists involved, was that these cases of microcephaly were occurring in an area where there had been significant amounts of Zika outbreaks in Brazil. So what you have uh, in this slide here uh, is uh, in, in the higher area. Uh, these are the clustering of cases of microcephaly. And here you have the outbreaks of Zika. And there was... The, the stronger the incidence of Zika, the more microcephaly cases there were. So this provided the first very strong hint that microcephaly might be caused by Zika, but clearly other things might have been responsible. Uh, so they went on to do a number of virological studies which demonstrated that Zika can cross the placenta, can get into babies, can get into uh, brains. Uh, and then they also went, uh, other epidemiologists went, to look at the last place there had been a Zika outbreak, which was in French Polynesia. And when they looked back, they found the same thing had happened. The Zika outbreak was followed by microcephaly. So this is a combination of epidemiology and virology, which led to what the WHO now considers to be a near certain association uh, between the two. Now, microcephaly in children is not, unfortunately, the only risk. So it is highly likely that a child born with significant microcephaly will go on to have significant neurological damage for the rest of their life. And these are um, MRI scans uh, comparing normal children and those with some forms of microcephaly, where the brain looks remarkably normal but is small, uh, and at the bottom, someone with a Zika virus infection, where not only is the brain small, but also even you don't have to be a radiologist to see that that is significantly different uh, from the ones above. So there clearly is going, tragically, to be a lot of people, of babies who are born with microcephaly, who will go on to have severe neurological impairment for the rest of their lives. And the, in some cases, it will certainly shorten their lives. We also, though, have good uh, evidence that there is association with uh, hearing loss, with blindness, and with a number of other neurological problems. And I think almost all of us think that they're underneath the tip of the iceberg of babies who've got obvious microcephaly, there will be a large iceberg of babies who've got significant neurological damage, which will only become apparent as they grow older and their development 
becomes delayed compared to their peers. So this is going to be a very significant future problem. Now, the main risk of this, in fact, almost all of the risk, appears to be concentrated in the first trimester of pregnancy. That's the first third of pregnancy in women who are pregnant. In other uh, pregnant areas of pregnancy, in the second two trimesters, it looks as if the risk is negligible, at least of microcephaly itself. Can't say for sure on other neurological damage. And based on the numbers of cases that we are expecting of Zika, uh, we currently estimate that around 1.7 childbearing women will be affected in the Americas in the first wave of Zika, and we would therefore anticipate there will be tens of thousands of babies who are born with microcephaly, and there may be more who are born with neurological damage we have not yet seen. So this is a non-trivial problem. Now, the reason for being reasonably confident about this is the epidemiology of this. And what I've illustrated this with uh, is a, a nice study uh, recently published uh, which showed here is the peak, and these are dates along the bottom, here is the peak of Zika transmission in a particular area of Brazil. And then you can see the peak of the microcephaly cases being born. And here are their pregnancies divided into three sections, first, second, and third. And what you can see is it's only people who are exposed, the, the, the big peak is in the period that would be the first trimester. So this is more than six months later. So the good news is if you're infected out of the first trimester, the risk appears to be very, very small. The bad news clearly though is if you're infected in the first trimester, the risk uh, is non-trivial. And for those who are infected in the first trimester, it looks on the current numbers as if the risk of a baby having microcephaly is somewhere between one and 13%. So this is non-trivial. Mosquito spread, uh, which Professor Cox will be talking about later, is of course not the only way you can spread Zika. Um, and the other form of transmission, which uh, is undoubtedly there but is rare, uh, is sexual spread. Men can spread Zika to women, uh, and women, much more rarely, can spread Zika back to men. Um, obviously, the, the uh, effect of spreading from women to men is much less worrying because men don't get pregnant. So the big worry is a man infecting a woman who is pregnant in their first trimester. That's the bit though, where we are clearly concerned. And sexual spread is happening at very low numbers, but it is happening in people who've returned from Latin America all around the world. So in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. Very small numbers. The problem we have at the moment is that it is not clear how long men remain infectious after they have become, they've had Zika. So whilst the virus in their blood gets cleared very quickly, it hangs around uh, in semen uh, for many weeks. And initially the advice was uh, eight weeks, we should people should delay having unprotected sexual intercourse. Uh, now I think people are saying this should be uh, probably up to six months is WHO's recommendation in people who are trying to get pregnant and uh, have been at risk of Zika. Now, this is the um, epidemiology curve for Zika in Brazil. And these, these are almost up-to-date um, uh, numbers uh, right from the first week of the year. And what you can see is that the epidemic peaked um, uh, around about uh, the eighth week, seventh and eighth week, and it's really tailed away to virtually nothing here. Now, several things can be taken away from this graph, but one thing shouldn't be. The first thing you can take away from this graph is that the uh, rather extreme views about how Zika was going to be spread from Brazil because of the Olympics, which happened around here, uh, were massively exaggerated. The second thing is that there is a seasonality to Zika transmission. And the third is, in my view, that if Zika's sexual transmission was a serious problem, we would not have seen this tail away to virtually nothing. This is, in my view, demonstrating this is a very rare problem. However, what you shouldn't take away is that because the curve has come right down, that means the epidemic is over. That absolutely is not the case. And this, the reason for that, you can see if you look at dengue cases, which are transmitted by the same mosquito by week in Brazil. And what you can see is they have exactly the same pattern year on year. There is a transmission season, 
which is the period when actually the mosquitoes are active, as Professor Cox will go on to talk about. And during that time, there is substantial transmission. And then it goes down to very minimal numbers for a quite a long period of the year, and then comes back. This is what we anticipate will happen with Zika over the next few years in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America. So this is going to come in waves. And at this point, I'd just like to talk a little bit about how um, in, in uh, populations, uh, well, mosquito-borne uh, viruses, how the epidemiology, what actually drives the epidemiology of the disease. And there are several things that drive it. The first of which is, what is the geographical range of the, of the mosquito? No mosquitoes, no disease. That's the reason that the UK is protected. We do not have the right mosquitoes to pass this on. The second thing, as demonstrated in the last graph, is there are highly seasonal factors because in almost every country, for almost every mosquito disease, there is strong seasonality. So there's a, there's a high transmission season and there's a low transmission season. But the other things, uh, the other main driver of what happens in the epidemic is what happens to immunity. If you've got a situation where all the, everyone who is green is non-immune, you have two uh, people who are red, they're infected. They could, with a highly transmissible infection, this is obviously schematic, this wouldn't be true of Zika, infect virtually everyone around them. Because everyone around them, everyone that the mosquito bites then bites, is non-immune themselves. But if you wait several years to a situation where most of the population are immune because of repeated waves of infection, then you'll have a situation where you have this, for example, this person is infected, but they're surrounded by people who've got immunity. This is called herd immunity. And this means that these people essentially protect the green person up here because the transmission just doesn't get that far. There's a donut of immunity around them. So this is uh, the third and the most, probably the most important thing which determines the long-term epidemiology. And then, additionally, there's travel by infected people. So Zika is being spread around the world, not by mosquitoes, but by humans getting onto planes and then getting off in places where the mosquitoes exist. And there will be a little bit of sexual spread. Uh, we anticipate uh, people who share intravenous drug-using needles and are infected might be able to pass it on, but you really have to try then. And if they're sharing needles, Zika is not their major public health problem. Now, using these informations, it's possible to model out how we anticipate the Zika transmission will go. And forward modelling is a very, very uh, unstable thing mathematically, which for reasons I'm not going to go into, but you should accept, accept that all projections forward, uh, rather like projections of the stock market, uh, can be wrong. However, the likelihood, based on good modelling um, done by colleagues at the Imperial College here and others, would suggest there's going to be peaks of unknown size, but there will be peaks over several years now, and at a certain point, enough of the population will be immune, because it looks as if with Zika, you get the infection and you remain immune for quite a while, and then at that stage, what will happen is there will be outbreaks, and then there will be probably several years, maybe 20 or 30 years, before the next big outbreak happens. But if nothing happens, if we cannot control the mosquitoes effectively, and we cannot get a vaccine, this is what will happen with Zika. And you can see uh, what's happened when you look at dengue spread by the same mosquitoes, and I'm not only to walk you through these, because these are, these are very obvious. Uh, on the left, this is the 80s, that's the 1990s in the middle, uh, and on the far right is the early 2000s. And this is the spread of dengue. This is what we anticipate will happen with Zika uh, here and in other areas. Now, turning to, to, to dengue, dengue is another very serious infection, probably less recognised by the press here in the UK, um, but uh, reported cases have risen from just under half a million in 1996 to over three million uh, now, and these will be underestimates. So this is a serious infection. All of these countries in yellow are where there is dengue because the ADs can transmit and my predict prediction, which is not a particularly difficult one to make, is anywhere where there is dengue, there will be Zika. That's a virtual certainty in my view. And what you see with dengue infections is exactly what the modelers were predicted for Zika. Waves of transmission, then periods of years where there's no transmission and then another big wave. That is what we anticipate will happen with Zika over time. Now, dengue um, is a very different disease to uh, Zika, although it shares some things. Um, we know that probably, WHO estimates would be, 
50 to 100 million symptomatic cases a year. So this is a, not a, this is a common disease where, in many parts of the world. Like Zika, only 25% of people actually have symptoms, and those who do, most people, just have rash, fever, and headache. But even non-severe cases of dengue, and it's possible people in the audience have had dengue, are extremely unpleasant. Very bad headaches, aching muscles, feeling tired, and many people get very exhausted after dengue. It's rather like people who have glandular fever. And the dengue blues, people feeling very depressed after uh, dengue, were well known well before chronic uh, infection, uh, chronic uh, post-infective fatigue syndromes were fully understood. Uh, the rash you get with dengue is this one here. You can, if you're trying to work out whether someone's got a rash that's a dengue one, you can just put your hand on their back uh, and you can see your palm print uh, like that. The reason we take dengue seriously, however, is that there are severe cases. Uh, in uh, 2013, WHO uh, said, estimated it was responsible for approximately 3.2 million case, uh, cases and 9,000 deaths. These numbers are, I would say, with huge confidence intervals around them. But it has two major causes of mortality and morbidity. The first of which is dengue hemorrhagic syndrome, seen here, where people's clotting stops working and they bleed either into their skin, potentially into their brain, into their gut. So they die of shock or they die of bleeding into a critical area. And the second one is something called dengue shock syndrome, which is where the capillaries of their, blood, their body get very leaky and all the blood in their blood system leaks into the body and therefore their blood pressure drops and they get shock. This is, uh, these are the major ways. The case fatality of these is somewhere between 1% and 10%. Uh, 20% rather, this depends in large part on how well they're managed. So if you're managing a unit that's used to managing it, the mortality should be 1%. In, if you don't treat it well, it's going to be significantly higher. Now with dengue, we've had dengue as a severe problem on our radar for a lot longer. So we've been investigating vaccines for dengue uh, for quite a while. And I'm going to talk about dengue vaccines first and then Zika vaccines. There are four types of dengue um, uh, which uh, coexist, and epidemics tend to come in sequence. So they don't, you don't, don't tend to get type 1 and then type 1 and type 1. You get a type 1 and then type 3 and type 2 and so on. The first infection you get will confer complete immunity, probably for life, to that type. The next type, and that also provides some short-term immunity to the other types of dengue which you could have, but it is only short-term. The problem we have, however, <coughs> excuse me, is that the second infection that you get can be primed by the immune system to be actually more severe than the first one. Now, that's a real worry if you're trying to make a, a vaccine to something which has got four types. And the reason people were very cautious about dengue vaccines is they thought, let's say we do one that makes you immune to one, you might actually get more severe disease with two, three, or four, and actually you could in fact do more harm than good with this vaccine. So that was a really severe uh, concern. But uh, despite this, because it's a major public health problem, people have gone on to try making dengue, dengue vaccines. There are really quite a lot now in development, but one has just been in the last few months endorsed by WHO. Uh, very big trials uh, on this uh, vaccine uh, in both Latin America and Southeast Asia. And there's some good news and some less good news with this. The good news is the overall vaccine efficacy, the overall protection it provided, was around 60% over two years. We don't know beyond that yet, but that is pretty good protection. Not 100%, but pretty good, 60%. And the efficacy, and this is very important, against hospitalisation was actually higher in most of these settings. Uh, but it varied a lot. So it was as low as 40% uh, in serotype 2 and 75% in serotype 1. So it varies. They're not equally effective against all the forms of dengue. But there are some significant cautions to this. The first is it seemed less effective in children under 5, only about 34% protection. And this is part of the children under 5 are one of the groups that get very severe problems with dengue. So this is a concern. Secondly, it's much more effective in people with previous exposure, about 80%, uh, 
than those who don't have previous exposure, about 40%. I.e. it's twice as effective if you've previously had dengue, which when you think about it, it's not that surprising because we know the second infection with dengue gives you like, probably broad protection, whereas the first one only protects you against that type. And if you start, and if you looked, there was some evidence that there were actually more hospitalizations in children given the vaccine when they subsequently got dengue than there were in other ones. And WHO therefore have said with this, if you model it out, if you start to use this vaccine in low incidence countries or to people who haven't much chance of having had dengue before, you will probably do more harm than good. So what WHO have said is, this vaccine is useful if you use it in a country where there's a lot of dengue, but it is not useful and may even be dangerous if you use it in a people who've got a low risk. So for example, for travellers, this would not be a vaccine I would recommend at this point in time. And it demonstrates the difficulty of providing vaccine. These vaccines have been looked for now for decades. So vaccine development is a slow and difficult business. So can we move uh, over to a Zika vaccine? Well, I think theoretically the answer is clearly yes. Zika does appear, although I, the epidemiology is changing, you know, the, our understanding of the epidemiology is improving the whole time now, but it's likely that Zika confers long-term and probably lifelong immunity. And just as with infections that do that, like measles, generally something which confers lifelong immunity with one infection is something which is a good target for a vaccine, much more so than things where that's not true. There are several vaccine candidates in development, and the animal studies have so far been extremely encouraging. They do appear to suggest protection. There is a bit of a concern that they could be cross-reactive with dengue, and this could go in whole heaps of different ways. For example, Zika vaccine could be less effective if you had a dengue, or it could be that Zika could produce the same effect in low incidence cases as dengue vaccine. So this is quite a concern, this overlap. But I think most people think this is probably something we need very firmly to push on with. Clearly, protecting women of childbearing age is the priority here. Rather like with rubella, they are the group you want to protect. You want to protect them before they first become pregnant. But I think if one is being realistic and barring something quite extraordinary, most people would say even if a vaccine is possible, and I think most people think it is, it will be many years before we have one that we are secure enough to use in public health. Therefore, for the foreseeable future, what we're left with is trying to control the mosquito. And this is what I'm going to hand over to Professor Cox about. Well, those of you who read um, the novels of Patrick O'Brien um, will recall, I hope, um, there's an item in the Commodore in which the following sea shanty is mentioned. It says, beware, beware, the bite of Benin, for few come out, though many go in. Now, this refers to uh, a shores of um, West Africa, about 400 miles, um, which became the most dangerous place on the earth for um, three centuries. And most notorious, of course, in the late latter part, it was in fact called the um, Slave um, Coast. Now, um, this was dangerous, this area, because of two diseases. And one, malaria, and the other one, yellow fever, both transmitted by mosquitoes. And the mosquito we're talking about at the moment um, is um, Aedes, Aedes aegypti. And um, this moved from Africa, to originated in Africa, until now, it's, and it circles the world um, around the tropics and subtropics. It's found right around the world um, and has spread amazingly here. So um, the mosquito itself, it is a very, very striking um, creature indeed. Um, I did a television interview this afternoon and the interviewer said to me, you're rather fond of that mosquito, aren't you? And I think the answer is yes. I have always had a soft spot for it, um, particularly when I was a student at the School of Tropical Medicine. And what I'd hoped for in the examination is that this mosquito would come up as something to, to identify, which you can do at arm's length, rather than little brown and grey jobs, which are almost impossible to identify. So since that time, I had a great deal of affection for this mosquito. It is a very striking mosquito, and um, it won, I think, all, well, would win all the prizes and beauty contests um, for mosquitoes. Um, now, this uh, relationship with me and the mosquito um, is, in fact, reciprocal. 
And because the meat taquito is one, and actually it likes me very much. And I spent many a happy afternoon with a cup of coffee in one hand and my other arm in a cage of hungry mosquitoes. So we've got this reciprocal arrangement. They found me um, very, very attractive. There are three main groups of mosquitoes. There's the Anopheles group, the transmit malaria, the Aedes group, which we're talking about now, and the Culets group, and they're the ones that make our picnics and barbecues an absolute nightmare um, throughout the summer. And the life cycle of all these mosquitoes is exactly the same. Um, the female um, lays her eggs um, in water. The eggs hatch into larvae, and the larvae are the free living stage here. Um, they feed um, and um, live for about five or six days. And these develop into the pupa, uh, the pupae are the final stage. They don't feed at all. They simply serve as a vehicle for the adult mosquitoes um, to emerge. And that's basically the life cycle. And I think all of us know that um, this life cycle is the one um, with the malaria parasite, associated with the malaria parasite. Now, at this stage, don't be frightened, because I'm going to say forget everything you ever knew about the malaria mosquito, because it doesn't apply at all to the Aedes mosquito. And I'll try to explain why. Um, we start off at the beginning here with the egg. Now, the female mosquito here lays her eggs um, in damp places. She doesn't like water, damp places, all sorts of damp places. And um, these can be as um, small as actually um, an eggshell, coconut shell, shouldn't be, uh, all sorts of places like this. And um, they can survive for a long time. They can, they can survive desiccation for up to six months or more. So they're really very, very resistant indeed. And um, the um, female then lays her eggs, not in one place, but in batches, a hundred or so, in various different places there. So she spread her eggs around a bit. Now, the choice of where she lays her eggs is very, very important indeed. Um, they range from small butts, water butts, gutters, and virtually anything where there's water. Um, and this is an example of some of the places where the mosquitoes um, lay their eggs. Um, absolutely anywhere you go, you will find um, patches of water. They even lay their eggs on damp filter paper, which is a tremendous bonus for biologists, because, of course, all we have to do is then dry them up, put them in an envelope, and send them off to somewhere else on the other side of the world. But this wasn't a good idea. Now, the desiccation or the, um, able to um, survive desiccation explains why this mosquito is so widespread. So let's get back to Africa now. Um, in Africa, the ships take on water. Um, they have lots of water butts there. And um, the mosquito, female mosquito, doesn't like um, lay her eggs in water, but she does lay it um, in the water line, just above the water line, with a certain amount of splashing there. And so these cross in this particular case, across the Atlantic, but to anywhere else. Um, and there at the other end, um, what happens is that the water's a bit stale, so everyone tips the water up into the local waterways and refills the barrel several times um, with the eggs with it. Now, the eggs um, then hatch very, very quickly. As soon as they get any moisture at all, um, they hatch. And I cannot think of a better way of spreading any sort of um, organism than this. Um, we, as human beings, have really helped in the spread of this particular organism. Now, let's look at a few more of those living slides. And um, these slides I'm going to show you are amalgam of slides. I've thought, rather than take a picture of one. And um, this is um, mainly based on dengue. And um, obviously, you expect, sorry, um, you expect to find them in cans, flower pots, vases, drains, and gutters. And in fact, in one survey, um, they found 50 different um, breeding sites. And these range, I say, from gutters and um, barrels um, to even eggshells and bottle tops. So they're quite able to lay their eggs absolutely anywhere. But what is very surprising, I think, is the bottom one, is that tires, used tires, seem to be the most important way of distributing this particular mosquito. And um, the uh, trade in used tires is absolutely immense. Um, Japan, for example, um, exports um, used tires to 130 different countries. And there's a fantastic amount of movement of tires around the world. Now, tires are virtually indestructible. Yeah. Um, tires are virtually indestructible, um, and they keep moving around. And all you could do is go to any harbour, and you will find the buffers are tires. And I've yet to see or hear of a tire that doesn't contain some water. 
And it's the most effective way of spreading things. Yeah. Now, um, this is a picture taken in Kenya, which gives some idea um, of the amount of tires that are around. And it's been estimated, in fact, that there is one tire for every man, woman, and child on the planet. So a lot of these are around. So these are probably the most important. So I said the eggs are very important. They, they survive desiccation. And um, uh, this is how they reach the new world. Now, the next stage of the life cycle is the larva. And here the larva has a number of advantages. Um, it can survive starvation. None of the other mosquito larvae can. It can survive starvation. And it has another advantage because um, if it's laying its eggs, the female's laying its eggs um, in little pieces of water, there are no predatory fish around. So it is safe there. So the, even the larva has um, this advantage, or these two advantages there, um, that um, enhance the possibility of this um, particular mosquito spreading around. Now, I'm going to move on now very quickly um, to the most important, little important mosquito is um, Aedes albopictus. Now, um, Aedes albopictus is very closely related to Aedes aegypti, but has a very different distribu distribution because it occurs um, in temperate areas um, rather than the tropics. And um, this is the one that scares me most. I think we're talking about this here. So um, if we look at the temperature range of these mosquitoes, um, you'll see, in fact, that um, Aedes aegypti um, can't survive at temperatures below 22 to 28, about 22 to 28 where Aedes albopictus um, can go down to about 17. So there's a very vast difference um, in the ability to, so, um, to tolerate um, cold in these areas there. And that's very important, um, what I'm going to say next. Now, um, here we find the distribution of albopictus in Europe. And you'll see from this picture there, there's a lot of it about. Um, the, you'll find some over here. Um, in, this is um, Georgia, southern Russia there, but right across um, southern Europe, the whole of Italy, um, into France, down to Spain, Greece, is the distribution of Aedes albopictus. Now contrast that with the distribution of Aedes aegypti in Europe. This is the one that transmits uh, yellow fever and Zika. And there, just very, very small indeed. You can see there, again, in Georgia and um, south um, and parts of um, South, uh, South the Soviet Union. Now, let's go back in and contrast those two again. So we're going from that one to that one. So why does it worry me? Well, it worries me because we do know that the Zika virus can survive and be transmitted by Anopheles albopictus. So the big scare now is, and what would happen if this mosquito became the vector of Zika? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. You can see it there. We would have um, the mosquito and Zika across the whole of the south of Europe. And um, this is not an unlikely possibility. Now, the other interesting problem that we all see is um, global warming. Because you'll see in the previous slide that um, Aedes um, albopictus has a much wider range. And so if we just pretend now we're switching um, Aedes aegypti um, up a few degrees centigrade, um, it would be very, very easy for um, Aedes um, aegypti, the one we're worried about, um, to move into this range here. So from, it, sorry. so from its previous range, it will move right across there and um, ruin um, all our summer holidays. Um, so um, now if we make some conservative estimates about um, global warming, um, it's happening about... 2.5 degrees centigrade um, every 100 years. So it'll be a very long time um, before it reaches us. But it's not going to be very long before it's across the whole of southern Europe. So um, I've used those two maps. I could have ones of America and Australia as well, but it's too confusing. I think it's easier to um, keep um, just to, um, to Europe there. Now, how do we control this mosquito? Well, it's not impossible. It has been done in the past. Um, at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, yellow fever and malaria um, threatened the construction of the Panama Canal. And uh, this was overcome 
by a massive amount of effort there. Really quite draconian methods were used to get rid of the mosquito. And um, by about 1906, um, five or six from 102, um, it was virtually eliminated. The mosquito was virtually eliminated from the Panama region. That's why we have the Panama Canal now. It wouldn't have been uh, possible if the mosquito had actually been there. Um, and they, uh, this involved um, what everyone calls clean-up, and I'll talk about clean-up in a couple of moments, and massive fumigation, and quite savage draconian methods. And because um, the fumigators used to go into people's houses without any permission at all and spread the fumigants around all over the place, um, it worked. Um, it could have worked, I say, in the 1900s. It is not likely to work again. Now, in the 1950s, Brazil actually managed to get rid of Aedes aegypti by massive amounts of DDT, using massive amounts of DDT. We can't do that anymore. We cannot do that kind of thing. And so what have we got available to us? Well, sorry. Now, this is a composite slide. And um, you just look at the details of this. But there are 18 methods for controlling intervention with um, bringing the Aedes mosquito under control. And I think all you have to do um, is look at the length of these lines. These are all different kinds of trials together. It's a very complicated composite um, slide. And you'll see here that cleanup. Um, is the most effective. And um, cl by cleanup, what I mean is everyone going around, making sure that nothing's left uncovered, getting rid of puddles, and everywhere where mosquitoes could it. It's a community business. And then if you go down here, you'll see the next um, important one is education. So we've got two here now. We've got community work um, in uh, cleaning, cleaning up, and we've got education there. Now, against that, um, very, very little um, else makes anything. Um, outdoor fogging is the use of insecticides. Now, the Aedes mosquito bites out of doors, not indoors. So the methods we can use against malaria don't work at all. And if we use impregnated bed nets, which have been so successful in bringing malaria under control, you see they're virtually useless um, in um, trying to control Aedes aegypti. And um, now, if you look at the top here, um, I'm going to mention this a bit. This is called the release of um, there are males. And at the bottom down here, the one we're all told to look at for bed nets, virtually useless. So if we look again at um, the methods that can be used, um, first of all, and again, these are arbitrary figures. There are a lot of data from lots and lots of different sources. And the community-managed cleanup, very effective. Water covers, very effective. House screening, effective. And the standard methods, um, fogging with insecticide, not very effective. And larvicides, which are very, very commonly used, very little um, effect at all. Now, if you look at personal ones, um, indoor residual insecticides, they don't work, of course. The mosquito bites out of doors. Bed nets, no use at all. Knockdown sprays, virtually useless. Insecticidal coils, no use. And repellents, very little use indeed. Um, so um, what I'm coming around to is that um, we do need um, some other sort of method. Now, um, there are several ways in which um, we are progressing, I think, in this area. And both, all of these are in the infancy. Um, now, the first one, um, sorry, um, that's to bring you back to Professor Whitty's one here. This is a poster in Malaysia, uh, sorry, in Singapore. And he talked about hemorrhagic fever. And that's part of the education. Lots and lots of posters around that. Made it, you know, it's quite dramatic there. If they bleed, you will bleed. And it, it is quite dramatic. And Singapore does take this very, very seriously indeed. Now, there are two methods which are being tried. First of all, there's the use of sterile males. And that is to use male insects that are sterile. So um, the female mosquito mates once in her life. If she mates with a sterile male, she can't produce any offspring. And um, this has worked extremely well for about a dozen or so crops, but it hasn't worked so well um, with um, human diseases. Um, there have been some very, very effective um, methods, but they worked short term uh, in islands, isolated um, places. Now, the problem with that um, that I see, and I think most people see this, is that um, you've got to swamp the area with these terrain male mosquitoes, and that is going to be an absolutely huge problem. And, um, one of our professors here, Steve Jones, 
um, tells me, in fact, that in order to get this gene, this fertility, into the population, um, you need to have a driver of some kind, an adaptive advantage. But of course, if you've got sterile males, you don't have that advantage, they don't mate. So I think this is something that um, might well be tried, but I think it's a very long shot. Now, the second one is um, more interesting. It's the idea of actually um, genetically modifying the mosquito um, so that the um, young are actually transferred from females to males. It's a male and female. And um, this um, works in the laboratory. But it does actually mean virtually genetically modifying each single mosquito, which makes it um, rather impractical. So um, I think that um, both of these are quite interesting, uh, but for the future. Now, we've got two insect pathogens. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis, BTI, is very well known. It's, a, it's, a, it's an inse a natural insecticide, a bacterial insecticide, and it is very, very effective. But if you remember, I went back to the slide earlier, and I put up BTI way down the list of um, things that are effective. And there's another um, disease called Wolbachia, another bacterial disease um, of mosquitoes. And um, again, that can be spread. But the great difficulty here, as I said earlier, is getting these things to spread in the population and to reach a high enough level. So actually, I think we're dreaming um, at the moment. And um, this is the BTI. You can buy it over the market, over the, over the, uh, in Singapore and other places like that. And basically, um, mosquito dunks. Um, it's, it works, um, but it's only going to work um, on small size. It's fine for your garden pond or something of that kind. It's not going to work um, on the large scale. Now, the main problems that I see um, are nothing to do with um, the disease um, or the mosquito itself. It's first of all the spread of urbanization because this is a mosquito that likes living near humans. It's got a very short range. It only flies for about 400 meters. Um, so it really likes to be near human beings. Um, the spread of farming, because farming now is encroaching into all sorts of different sites. And again, people go out in, uh, into the field and I say the mosquito bites in the day out of doors and the farmers are at tremendous risk here. And then there's the encroachment on jungles, and I've seen this happen in Malaysia. Um, and uh, um, there's a malaria parasite, actually, that's only come to our notice very recently because of um, deforestation. People have moved into the jungles, to destroy the jungle, farmed up to it, and um, this is going to be a main problem. I think lack of planning is another one. And um, planning is a dirty word in many areas, but um, we do need to plan. And then global travel. And we just take it for granted we can go anywhere we like and do anything we like. Um, it's not that easy um, to stop people travelling around. And it's not going to be terribly easy to stop someone having um, mosquito eggs in their pleats of their shoes, for example. Um, they don't look for that at the um, customs. Um, then ignorance. And I said earlier that education was most important. Education is important. And it's ignorance on everybody's part. Uh, the, and part of the um, government, the part of those, some of the scientists who are working in this area, and mainly in the um, general public. And then there's political inaction and or incompetence, and uh, we're, we're all very, very aware of that. Now, um, Professor Whitty has pointed out, in fact, there are some very good examples of um, good practice, um, but what we want is actually um, much more good practice. Um, it's all very well having good practice in places like Brazil and Singapore and Malaysia. Um, good practice is going to be very difficult in other parts of the world, particularly in those areas where countries are in conflict with one another. And this is going to be a major problem. Now, finally, I just want to say that someone at a conference said to me um, that if Zika reaches Stockholm, we're in real trouble. Um, well, it's probably not. And um, this would never to be in fact us, of course, if it reached Stockholm. Now, um, I'm absolutely certain that this will not happen any time soon. Absolutely certain about that. But remember that Michael Fish, the weather forecaster, <laughs> once said there are no gales on the way on the night before the great storms of 1987. Thank you.